First Sergeant Robert Lewis Gaines, United States Marine Corps, Korea, the Forgotten War. I interviewed Robert in Las Cruces, New Mexico, March 25th, 2006. I actually made several trips to Las Cruces during those years, interviewing a lot of veterans, and just loved those people down in that area. I flew into El Paso and drove up to Las Cruces. Fond memories of my time with Robert. And uh, Robert served, like I said, in the Marine Corps. He actually fought in six campaigns in his time in the military. And he was at the Chosen Reservoir, the Frozen Chosen, and tells a unique story about the Chosen Reservoir. He served with Fox Company, 2nd Battalion, 7th Marines, 1st Marine Division folks, and another great perspective of the Korean War. My father served during the Korean War, and regrettably, it's called the Forgotten War. It shouldn't be called that. You know, people came home from Korea, it's like, where you been? You know, and they, they just didn't acknowledge it. It's after World War II, I can understand that. But from a history standpoint, we need to learn about the Korean War. We lost almost as many troops there as we did in Vietnam in 10 years in Vietnam, three years in Korea, so. But uh, Robert tells a great story. And I wanted to tell you that in this interview I did with him, he talks about Tootsie Rolls candy. And uh, Tootsie Rolls saved his life. I'll let him tell the story. And uh, if you know your history, you know that Tootsie Rolls were part of the reunions that these veterans had from Korea. And uh, I'll let Robert tell you, it's a, it's a really great story. So I want to thank Michael and Darlene Sarofsky. Thank you guys. You wanted to sponsor a Korean story. Thank you for making it possible for others to learn about the Korean War through Robert's eyes and ears today. God bless you guys. Thank you for working with me, standing with me in this fight. And as I go to Arizona next month, thank you for helping me to do that. So love you guys. Folks, I'd encourage you to get involved with this ministry, this work. It is a ministry, folks, to give honor to whom honors do. It's a labor of love. And I, there's information in my video description, in the comment section of my videos. These aren't just words that I say to fill time. This is important. So I hope you, you, you will, will consider doing that. It will be a blessing. And my website is LarryCapetto.com. You can find all that information there. Voices of History Radio is on, on the air 24 hours a day, seven days a week, folks, across the world. If you haven't tuned into it, Voices of History Radio, it's on my home page. You can download apps for free or just listen to it on my website. So anyways, that's going strong and all these stories will end up there. And I'm happy to have that as a supplement to this station. So I want to let you know that Robert's wife, Carol, served in the Marine Corps. She was a captain. That's a story in and of itself. So we lost Robert in 2015. And uh, he's buried at Fort Bliss National Cemetery in El Paso, Texas, folks. And it's been 18 years since I interviewed this man. So his story lives on. It's timeless. Thank you for subscribing to this channel, folks, and sharing these videos. That's what helps keep it going. Let's just keep this going as much as we can and uh, giving honor to our veterans, folks. And uh, how can we thank them enough for what they've done? Thank you for all of you out there that have helped support this work. God bless you for it. You were with the 1st Marine Division in Korea in 1950. Uh, did, you land, did you land on Incheon or would you come in Incheon? Or? No, uh, Korea broke out the 25th of June 1950 and I was on board ship in the middle of the Pacific Ocean coming back from Hawaii. I had been stationed in Hawaii. Uh, got home and went on leave for 60 days I guess it was, because I was June, yeah, 60 days or 45, whatever. Uh, at this point, the Marine, First Marine Division, the whole Marine Corps was only like 75,000 men. It was all. So they were pulling people from every place to fill out the division to first off the brigade to go to, to uh, Korea. And um, for some reason, I was not called back off a of leave. Mm -hmm. And my regiment, the 7th Marines, was primarily reserves. They'd pulled reserves up from all over. 
And I got to Camp Pendleton um, around the last of August or the first of September, I forget now when it was, and reported immediately to Tent Camp 2, which was a base on the base at Camp Pendleton, and was there about four days, three days actually, and we shipped out for Korea then. And so I was a plank holder in the 7th Marines. Tell me what your rank was and, uh, during the Chosen Reservoir. Corporal, okay, fire you, team leader. Okay, and your MOS, fire team leader? No, my MOS, believe it or not, was a musician. Is that right? What did you play? <laughs> Bass drum. Okay. How'd you end up in a combat situation then? As I said, they were pulling everybody out, every place, and every Marine is a rifleman first. And so that was one of them. And our training, of course, prepared us for all of this. So let's just talk a little bit about the Chosen Reservoir. Can you lead me into the actual battle where you were as you, and, and tell me about the elements as they got colder and all that. Just, just walk me through the, the Chosen Reservoir slowly, the, your participation in that. Okay, well, let me go back to, uh, I did not make the Inshon landing. I came in five days after the Inshon landing. And I was probably, definitely, the first casualty in my company, possibly in the battalion. Coming down the landing nets and to the landing craft, somebody dropped their rifle on my head. Fortunately, I had my helmet on, but it careened off and hit me in the shoulder. And it's a good thing we didn't see any combat then, because I could hardly lift my arm. So we didn't have any real action until um, outside of Seoul. And Seoul had been liberated almost completely by the time we got through. I never saw any action in Seoul at all. But outside of Seoul was a monstrous mountain. I mean, it just straight up a million miles. And we were up on top of that, and we could see the North Koreans down in the valley going across the rice paddies. So they opened fire on them. Well, mistake on that because uh, we were occupying a position that the North Koreans had just abandoned some time ago, and there were foxholes and stuff like that. There was a little kid who was walking along selling apples, and he stopped at every foxhole. Well, he wasn't really selling apples. What he was doing was identifying the location of all of our people, and that was the first time we really came into combat. And a fire team has four people in it, and I lost one of my guys, so then we had three. Uh, the first Real action was uh, about the uh, 25th, 26th, 27th of October, 1950. Once again, we were up on a big hill. And uh, this was the first time probably that the Chinese really were coming in. And incidentally, later on, I got a clipping from my mother back in Nebraska, dated about the 25th of October, saying that 220,000 Chinese communists were uh, mustering on the border and coming across. So the Omaha World Herald knew about it, but evidently MacArthur didn't. So anyhow, we're, we're up on this hill, and there's a big firefight going down in the valley. And during the night, I heard bugles. And, you know, what, what? Clean my ears out. So in the morning, why, uh, we're sitting around. We didn't have any action. And we were talking about the firefight in the valley. And I said, you know, I heard bugles last night. And the guy said, I did too. He said, well, mine came from up there. He said, no, mine came from over there. I said, no, mine were up. And I looked up there, and I could see on the ridge line a guy shoveling dirt, making a foxhole or something. Hit the deck. He said, uh, there's somebody up there. Good guy's bad. They probably are bad because we were the farthest out. So we checked with the platoon leader, and he sent a fire team up to check it out. Well, if you're firing downhill, you have a tendency to overfire. I was not, I overshoot. I was not in the, uh, the uh, fire team that went up, but I was sighted in on this guy in the foliage. Well, they started shooting, and they overshot the platoon and hit down in our area, and that's where I got hit the first time. Uh, it didn't break the skin. I got hit, and it hurt in my left shoulder. I thought, oh, man, I felt and everything, no blood, no nothing. That night, why I was in the foxhole, my shirt pulled out, and something fell out, and it was a slug, the slug that hit me. It evidently was a ricochet because it was bent, and it hit me flat, so it didn't hit 
coming right in. Well, that was the first time we hit the Chinese. Then uh, we went up the mountain. Tok Tong Pass was between uh, the furthest element and the next furthest element. And we got to uh, Koto Ri, which is the pass coming up. And we stayed there for a little while, and we went on to Hagaruri. And once again, we're not having very much action. Uh, Hagaruri, and stayed there for a little while. And Captain William Barber was our company commander. You may have heard of him, Medal of Honor. And he uh, was told to, to uh, occupy a hill. Can okay, you talk about the captain, you said? Right, Captain Barber. So he was told to occupy this hill. Uh, in Tok Tong Pass, which was about halfway between Hagaruri and Udamni, which was about the farthest that the Marines got. And so we went up, believe it or not, in truck, a truck convoy. We got there, and it was relatively late at night. You know, it was dark. You know, I don't know how late it was. Um, and so we occupied the hill. The trucks went back. And uh, I don't know if that hill had once been occupied by the Chinese or not, because there were prepared foxholes around it somewhere. And, but, you know, we, it was dark and we were tired and everything we got there, so they said, okay, set up the perimeter and 50% watch. Well, I didn't have the first watch, so I'm in my sleeping bag, sleeping on top of the ground, not even in the ridge line, no place. Just, on top of the ground, because we were tired and we hadn't had too much action to that time. Then all of a sudden, the guy comes running down the line and says, the gooks are coming, the gooks are coming. I said, oh, well, <clears throat> then all of a sudden they started shooting. Well, we were out of that real quick-like, ran back up into the ridge line, and I found this hole, and I jumped in it. So we held them off. On my side, which was, I guess, the south side, because the road went right by it, the other side of the mountain really got hit hard of the hill, Tok Tong Pass, and uh, they held them off. We had some action over there and held them off. The next day, uh, as a matter of fact, there was another guy in the hole with me, and for 40 years or so, I never knew who it was. And uh, on one of the books that I just gave you, the reunion thing, I had written something about Tootsie Rolls, and he saw it, and he said, hey, I'm the guy that shared the foxhole with you. So that was, we got together after that. But anyhow, the next morning, we were in this hole and started to raise up to get out, and a, a bullet came through the little, we had a wooden, or not a wooden, but a, a dirt uh, parapet type thing in front. And that sniper, wherever he was, he was pretty accurate. We couldn't get out of the hole for like six or eight hours. <clears throat> and one slug, every time we pick our head up, a slug would come through. Another uh, one slug came through, and that's when I get hit the second time. And it hit me in the leg. It didn't break it again. So I saved those two shells for a long time, and then I finally lost them. But uh, they sent out somebody to get the sniper, and they evidently got him because no problem then. So the next three nights were pretty heavy fighting all around and we were managing to hold. Uh, we got two medals of honor and my company out of that action, a private and the captain. Uh, uh, General, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Ray Davis, you may have heard of him, had the first battalion, and he was up at UDAM Knee. And Captain Barber was told by our, our, our regimental commander, uh, Litzenberg, Homer Litzenberg, he said, why don't you move back because you'd be surrounded and cut off. He said, well, sir, I think we'll stay because if we move, that doubles the time and the, the, uh, the area that the first battalion has to come back. So if we keep this road open, we should be okay. So we did. We stayed there, and they came in that night, and then we marched back together. We had an airdrop of supplies and uh, had to go out and get them out in the field. We lost a couple of people doing that. Um, but we got everything and then started marching back. Now, tell me about the cold. I mean, tell me about the, the elements. <coughs> and, and was that more of a, 
uh, enemy to you than the Chinese? I mean, not more of an enemy, but it was an enemy. Yes, uh, we did not get any cold weather gear until we got up I, either either Kotori or Hagaruri. Now that is cold there, and this is November, and it's cold, snow, and everything. Uh, we did not have anything until that time, and then we got the shoe packs. Uh, which are big galoshes type thing, but they have a uh, felt um, liner, a sole liner that you put in. Well, they're okay, they're nice and warm when you're moving, but when you stop, you know, there's no heat generated and they can freeze because they sweat. So you had two sets, you're supposed to change them every day, which I did, and I constantly kept my feet, my toes moving all of the time. Well, it worked okay, but I just, I got frostbite anyhow. As a matter of fact, my uh, disability is just raised because of the frostbite. Uh, but I was very diligent in keeping that going and keeping my hands and fingers, you know, nimble. I still have a problem with my hands now too, but um, yeah, the cold was bad. Fortunately, we were in this hole, and in the hole, why it's relatively warm, because there's body heat from the guy next to you, and it was very close quarters. Uh, the bad thing was you'd have to take your mitten off to shoot. Well, a lot of guys really got frostbite then. Fortunately, you don't do a thing like this, keep it under your arm, whatever. And uh, yeah, the cold was bad. I, mean, I can't imagine some of the stories I've heard about the, how cold the frozen chosen, I mean, um, tell me um, now some of the stories about, let's say, about the food. I mean, did your food freeze? To tell you the truth, I don't hardly remember eating there at all. Uh, what I did was uh, what we had to eat, the sea rations, keep in your clothes next to your body, and that would keep them warm enough. Uh, the main thing that we could eat was uh, um, the chocolates and the sea rations but also the Tootsie Rolls. And uh, that was how I got reacquainted with the, my Fox Roll buddy. I, uh, the Tootsie Roll was celebrating their 100th year several years ago, it's in that little pamphlet there. And uh, they said, uh, Marines have always liked the Tootsie Roll and they uh, helped win the Battle of the Chosen Reservoir. If you have any stories, tell it. So my story was that coming out of the reservoir we got outside a couple of miles, and uh, my squad, my platoon really, was given one side of the road as a security guard while the others went through it. So I'm laying on my left side, looking out toward where the bad guys were supposed to be, and every time I moved, a bullet would come by and would kick up dirt, snow, twigs, stuff. If I didn't move, it was okay, but every time I moved, there is this sniper. So I rolled over to look and another shot came by and he was getting closer. And I looked, he had to be five or 600 yards away at least because way across the valley. So I just lay there for a while. As long as I was quiet, it was okay. Every time I moved, there was a shot. So I thought suddenly, I'm hungry. I had some Tootsie Rolls in my pack. So I rolled over, another shot, got the Tootsie Roll out, and then I saw what he was shooting at. Air panels are luminous nylon that you put out so that there, our own airplanes don't bomb or strafe us. And being the squad leader at that point, since my squad leader was killed, why I had him on the outside of my pack for easy access. Well, big mistake because that stood right out and that's what that guy was shooting at. So I wrote to, to um, Tootsie Roll and tell him how the Tootsie Roll saved my life. And they published it and Within about a month or so, there's a knock at the door. My wife goes to the door and opens it, and she starts laughing. Tootsie Rolls sent me two great big huge boxes of Tootsie Rolls. <laughs> now, did they publish that in one of their publications? Yes. Uh huh. And do you have a copy of it? It's in there. Yes. The Tootsie Roll publication. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did they use that as a form of promoting their product? You think, or what did they do? Oh no, no, no. They well. Have you ever seen an advertisement for Tootsie Roll? Oh, yeah. I haven't. I don't remember any. Well, I mean, maybe a written, uh, maybe not a television, but... Yeah. I, I don't remember any, any place. You know, you just bought them. You knew what they were. Okay. Maybe I haven't then. 
You know, maybe I had. Yeah. I thought I had, but maybe I hadn't. So I, I no, I don't think so. And as a matter of fact, when we had our reunion, um, this was a, well, this was a, about four or five years ago. I saved the letter that I had written before, and I sent it to the woman who had answered me and requested just to, you know, we're having this reunion, and this is what you did before. Uh, can you send us some more Tootsie Rolls? We'll hand them out. So she sent it, the same woman, Gordon, Ellen Gordon, I think her name was, and four or five huge boxes full of Tootsie Rolls and Tootsie Roll products and little banks and all sorts of things like that. Didn't ask anything in return. So you talked to Mrs. Gordon or you just heard? I don't remember whether I talked to her or not. No, I had the copy of when she sent me the others, you know, say thank you for the story, we'll do it. Uh, so I don't remember if, I, if she called me or if she wrote me, I don't remember now. Yeah, Mrs. Gordon's the CEO. Yeah, oh, really? Yeah, yeah I've actually talked to them a little bit. I haven't oh. talked to her, but Mrs. Gordon is the CEO of Tootsie Roll. Oh, I didn't realize that. She might not have been then, but she yeah. is now. Uh -huh. But uh, interesting story. Well, she is a neat lady. Interesting story. Um, Bob, tell me a little bit about the, the camaraderie in, in battle and combat, and maybe did you lose anybody close to you in The Chosen? Well, unfortunately, in my company, see, we had never trained together, never really worked together. Uh, a fire team has four people in it. Uh, I lost my first one outside of Seoul, and he was killed in that mortar barrage that we got when the little kid was pointing out our areas. Uh, he was killed, so then I had three. Well, my BAR man was a tall guy, but he had no shoulders. A BAR is a Browning automatic rifle and weighs 20 pounds plus all the ammunition and all that stuff. Well, he couldn't take it because he couldn't carry the BAR. So I lost him, so we're down to two guys. The other guy was smaller than I was, and I was only 135 pounds. So he was a BAR man and I was the fire team leader with one guy, and uh, had to carry the assistant BAR man's ammo, which is heavy also. And uh, the first time we came under attack, we strafed by our own airplanes. And uh, nobody was hurt, as I recall. But anyhow, when we hit the deck, why I ditched this, uh, the ammo belt and left it, and then we went on. And son of a gun, some guy came up, uh, I don't know, a mile down the road and said, hey, you forgot this. Oh, thank you. I had to carry it around my neck because I couldn't carry it anyplace else with everything we had. Uh, camaraderie. Uh, yes, the good thing about the Corps is the only place that you have to worry about is right in front of you. You got people on the left and right and behind, you don't have to worry about that because they're going to take care of you. I was never close to anybody uh, because the attrition rate was you know, so high, so I never really got to know anybody. There was one guy, and I can't remember his name now, and I don't even remember, he must have been in my squad, but I don't hardly remember him. Uh, and he got wounded the very first time, and I went to the warming tent to see him. But I can't even remember his name now. It's been so long. Never got in touch. My, my squad leader was uh, a guy by the name of uh, Kip, K-I-P-P, -P, Kenneth R. Kip. And he was a neat guy. He was a buck sergeant. He had maybe eight years in at that point. Was a squad leader, very knowledgeable, could tell jokes, sing, do everything. Coming out of the reservoir, why, he was the first one to get shot. So I reported to the lieutenant in charge, and he said, well, you're squad leader now. Well, I never had the squad. Where were they? You know, I didn't have any of my fire team left. So. So tell me again the job of a fire team leader specifically. What are you doing? Well, it, uh, a squad is 13 people. The squad leader is in charge of all of them. We have three fire teams of four people each in each squad, and I was in charge of that fire team. Uh, all I did was whatever the, the platoon sergeant or the squad leader or the lieutenant or anyone told us to do, you know. So I just was kind of an overseer. Uh, we had a Browning automatic rifleman, assistant BAR man, what they called a scout rifleman, and then the fire team leader. And actually, there were, was not much difference in 
what we did because uh, I was a corporal, they were all PFCs. So fire team meaning you're in a rifle squad, you're not in a rifle artillery squad. unit? Or no, anything. no. You're not directing fire on the Chinese? No. Okay. Well, unless it's my BA Armin. Yeah, yeah. But tell me a little bit more about combat. I mean, did you get into any hand to hand? Were you shooting at the Chinese? I mean, what, what, what did you experience? Any of that? Uh, no, I never got into hand, any hand in hand, and I don't understand why, because on our side of the slope on Fox Hill, it was a gradual slope. The road was right, right down below, and they could have, you know, just come swarming up there. We didn't have very many people. The other side of the mountain was rather steep and rocky, and that's where they were attacking, and I have no idea why. Uh, yeah, they were coming out, and uh, there were, well, maybe two days after the firefight, why we went out to retrieve the, the supplies that had been dropped from the airplanes. And there were bodies every place, and Chinese, of course. And we had a, a warming tent, and eventually all our dead and wounded, we put in that, and we had quite a few in there, too. We went out with uh, 200, uh, I'm going to guess 235 people, maybe, and when we got back, uh, going down the mountain pass why we were like 75, something like that, who were walking. No, I didn't have any hand-to-hand -hand combat. So you saw a lot of the casualties? You were oh, around yeah. That? I mean, mm -hmm. I heard there were quite a few. Did you get to help any of the wounded? Uh, when we got back to Hagaru, of our people, no, we, we got them up into the warming tents or wherever and then loaded them on vehicles. But uh, when we got back to Hagaru, since I was a squad leader then, why we sent out about six or seven guys. There was an army guy who had come into camp and he wasn't wounded or anything else, no weapon, no nothing, but he came into camp and said, we have got wounded up here in this, uh, this hut up on the side of the hill. So they sent me and about, well, I don't know, six, eight, ten guys out. And we went up there and so we carried them back uh, on stretchers and got them out. Uh, ran into no problems, no combat, no anything there. The Chinese mostly fought at night, except when we were pulling out of the reservoir, and then they were set up on each side of the, the road and shooting at us. Why do you think they fought at night? What was the advantage to that? Uh, we're not used to fighting at night. Uh, camouflage, so to speak, safer. Uh, the Marines especially are noted for, to be expert marksmen, so, you know, at three, four, or a hundred yards, why we could pick them off if we could see them. But this way, they were very, very close. And they had their primary weapon, well, they had a lot of Thompson submachine guns, which they had gotten from the Chinese communists, which we gave them after World War II, uh, but th what they called the burp gun. And the burp gun was a very small caliber, and you could get hit, well, when you did get hit, it'd go, Rrrr! that's what it sounded like, that fast you'd get hit five, ten times, but it didn't have a killing or knockdown power. If it hit you in the right place, of course, it would kill you. Uh, so they had to get close to use those weapons. And as a matter of fact, later on, I picked up a bayonet off of a dead Chinese uh, that was a 1909 from Hungary. Now, whether they had a, a rifle that it would fit on or not, I have no idea, but I still have it. Interesting. Yeah. Does, what are your thoughts about Korea today? I mean, 55 years ago, basically chosen reservoir. I mean, does it have any significance in your life? Do you think about it? Oh yeah, well, yes. Uh, and especially when we have our reunions, we do lots of talking about that. Uh, that was a war that we won because South Korea is still free. And South Korea is, is very um, self-sufficient and I don't know that they're furnishing the stuff all over the world, but uh, when people go back, they say, hey, you know, why is Bell be in the United States? It's that good. So we won that part of it. Also, we stopped the communists was the first time. Otherwise, we could have been in real serious trouble. So that's, it's an experience you never want to undergo, but having undergone it, it's invaluable. I grew up a whole lot over there. I feel that every person should be shot at in anger one time. Hopefully they get missed, but it, uh, 
Do you consider yourself a hero of any sort? Oh, no. No, I wasn't. I did what I was supposed to do. I never had the opportunity to do any more, you know. Um, there were lots of heroes. Uh, Hector Cavaretta, you probably have heard of him. Have you? I'm not sure. No, okay. Hector Cavaretta was a private in uh, uh, the company, and he was a, an Italian from New Jersey. So, you know, Italians in New Jersey, I'm not saying he was mafia. He probably wasn't. He was a neat guy. But anyhow, he, uh, his friends talked him into joining the Marine Corps Reserve. And as I said, most of my outfit was a reserve outfit. So uh, he said, why do I want to do it? I said, oh, man, you know, you just go to a meeting once a month, and they pay you for it, and that's beer money. He said, beer money? OK. So he joined, but he never went to any meetings, never went to a single one. One day, he's walking down the street, and he sees his friends say, hey, where are you guys going? He said, we're going to Korea. We've been activated. Who? The Marine Reserve. He said, well, I'm in the Marine Reserve. Well, then you're supposed to be going. So he went to see the first sergeant, whoever it was, and said, hey, the guys are going to Korea. What about me? He said, Hector, you never made a single meeting. We're going to discharge you. He said, man, I want to go to Korea. So they took him. He had never been through boot camp. He had never had any training. He had never fired the rifle, except maybe orientation on the way out in a replacement draft. And he won the Medal of Honor on the hill. And he and one other guy, and it's in there, uh, practically by themselves held off all of the Chinese on the other side of the mountain. And he was a big guy. And he had a rifle. His uh, uh, foxhole mate had been blinded. He, he, he got his eyesight back, but he had been blinded, so he couldn't shoot. So Hector is standing up, and he's about 6'4", six, 6'5". Six, and he would fire one, two, three, when he would empty his rifle. The other guy had, uh, had uh, refilled another one. So he picked it up and he kept going. And he was plinking these guys off. Well, he ran out of ammunition. They started throwing hand grenades. So he turned his rifle around. He was batting them back like he was playing baseball. And one he missed, and he picked it up to throw it back, and it exploded, and he lost a finger or something on it. But yeah, Hector, now there's a hero. What, what was the most difficult part of the Chosen Reservoir for you? You might have already answered that, but was there a more difficult thing that you experienced or saw or had to do? Well, probably was the march out, because that was a long way, and we had equipment we had to carry. We had to take the dead, and we didn't have to. We did. We took the dead and the wounded and all of our munitions and everything with us, all of our tanks and stuff. Uh, the walk back was, was tough. We didn't have much to eat or anything. Uh, sea rations are okay, but after a while you get tired of them. But that long walk back, and I walked all the way from Fox Hill all the way back down to uh, the bottom of the mountain, uh, Ham Hung. And that was probably the hardest. As a matter of fact, I, I say I walked all the way out except maybe the last 50 yards. And the last 50 yards, I'm tired and miserable and everything, and there was a Jeep came by with a trailer. And I thought, oh man, I'm going to get on that thing. I don't care. So I put my rifle up on it, and he took off. My rifle is on it. I'm hanging on to the back. So I ran the last 50 yards. And then they stopped, and then we were OK. So, But I, the combat, of course, was tough. But for me personally, the worst part was the march back. And uh, coming out of the reservoir at Hager River, as a matter of fact, I always tell this story to my students or anyone else. Uh, the 1st Marine Division was attacking to the south. We were not withdrawing or retreating. We were attacking to the south. You fight where the most enemy are, and the most enemy was behind us. So the 1st Marine Division was, was advancing to the south. The 7th Marines were the spear point of the 1st Division. Uh, the uh, second battalion was the spear point of the seventh Marines. Fox Company was the spear point of the second battalion. Uh, the third squad was the spear point of the uh, of the uh, first platoon. Oh, well, the platoon one, and then the first, then the squad, and then the fire team was the spear point, and number uno was me. So I was the first one out for about five minutes. The word was. 
there are bad guys shooting at us all over the place. If one or two people get hit, don't stop, keep going, because somebody's going to pick them up. If five at a time get hit, then you better stop. Well, we were only out a little ways, and five or more guys got hit, so then we had to run off to the, to the left, and there was a ridge line over there and some huts. That was a bad one, too. That was bad. And uh, that was where Sergeant Kipp got killed, and my first lieutenant, Dunn, was also killed. So from then on, I don't even know how many people were left in the platoon. But we, we, we liberated, we liberated the ridge line, then got back on the road, and then that was where I, we were put off on the side as security guard when a Tutsi roll saved my life. That, that was probably the worst one. Were you seeing? And that was also where I got hit the next three times. Mm -hmm. Not when I hit five times, never once broke the skin. Once went through my trouser leg, once went my, through my sleeve, and one off my helmet. Tell me uh, quickly again now, I've got it on there, I'm sure. You said the Tootsie Roll saved your life. Can you run that story by me one more time again? Okay, I had them in my pack. We had nothing to eat uh, from the time we left Hagaru and was getting light. We were off on the side of the road as security. That's when the sniper across the way was shooting at me. And every time I moved, he fired. Well, I got hungry, so I rolled over to get my pack off to get a Tootsie Roll out, and I saw that the air panels were on the outside of my pack. These are luminous nylon-type things, which uh, you can see you know, almost at night, and that's what he was shooting at. So when I saw that, since I was the squad leader, I had him outside in case our friendly airplanes came over and didn't want them to shoot at us because you can't tell from the air who's good and who's bad. So that was how I say the Tootsie Roll saved my life, because if I hadn't have taken it out, that guy might have got me. Gotcha, okay, gotcha. Okay, it didn't deflect a bullet or anything? No, 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 no. <laughs> okay. Um, were there times where you were shooting the Chinese? You saw them and you just were shooting them with your BAR? You had a BAR? No, I, no, I had an M1 rifle, okay. yeah. Were there, was it that, I mean, are you... That close, yeah. Okay. Yeah, at the bottom of the hill, this one time, uh, there was a hut at the base of the hill, and right where my foxhole was, was kind of steep. But off to the left there, it wasn't. It was, you know, very smooth and um, even territory. So I'm looking out, and there's a, the burp gun down below, and you can see the gun flash. I said, ooh, but he wasn't shooting at me. He was shooting off someplace else. So the next time he shot, well, I came up, and I emptied my rifle at him and uh, looked the next day to see if there's any blood or anything, but there wasn't, but he wasn't there. And he never shot anymore. So that was the closest that I got, otherwise why they're, you know, way on, in the distance. You think there's things you've blocked out of your mind or forgot about that were really bad there, or? Well, I don't know where I ever heard it, but somebody told me some time that no matter how bad and miserable you are and everything is, think of the fun you're going to have telling about it six months from now. And with that philosophy, why I kept thinking about it. And was I ever desperate? No. Was I ever uh, think I wasn't going to make it? No. Uh, when I was in the foxhole and the, the letter that I wrote, or that my friend wrote, Hutchinson, uh, I had my hand grenades on the parapet. I had my entrenching tool, which is a shovel, which I had made at a 90 degree angle to use as a, a weapon if I had to. And I had my rifle and I had my, my uh, ammunition pouches open so I could get more. So I was ready, you know, but I never doubted that I would come out. Did you ever wonder why you made it out and a lot of others didn't make it out? Did that ever cross your mind? No, not I got hit five times. <laughs> you know? uh, no, I, the Lord was watching over me. And when, I used to, when I had to watch, uh, I'd have my rifle in a hole, whatever, and I'd had a rosary in my right pocket, and, or my left pocket, and a hand grenade in my other pocket, and I was ready. So my guardian angel was looking after me. Tell me why we need, what was significant about this chosen reservoir part of North Korea? Why, why did we have to go in there 
Were you just trying to drive the Chinese back or the North Koreans back? What was the whole idea of that? Well, Russia was still a major threat in those days. And Russia was training and outfitting the North Korean army. And the North Korean army was a good army. And when they, uh, well, I don't know, we had some sort of a pact or something with South Korea, I guess. And we had just a few people there, just a very few. And um, the North Koreans came down and of course we had our advisory people there, so there were Americans in danger also. And we were afraid, I guess, that uh, if they took South Korea, what's next? You know, Japan could be next. Because we were very, very unprepared for everything. And I should say this too, you know, everyone, not everyone, but most people except for the army guys who were there, say the army were a bunch of uh, bug outs and so forth. Well, they were untrained, they were undisciplined, they were soft, uh, they were occupation forces, they were undermanned. Uh, you know, what are you going to do? Now, they shouldn't have thrown down their weapons and run, but, you know, a couple of guys do it and then pretty soon everybody does. But the main responsibility, I think, at that point was the, the army for not training them and having them prepared. Well, the Marines are always prepared, you know. I was a musician, I was a bandsman. And we had postal clerks and everyone else in there doing infantry work. And we did it. Fortunately, in my outfit especially, we had a lot of reserves who were World War II veterans. So they had already been through it. So that was another big plus for us. Like Kip, I'm sure, was World War II. But why did we fight at the Chosen Reservoir? What was the purpose of that battle? Well, MacArthur wanted us home by Christmas and he wanted to push the Chinese back across the Yalu River and head toward the Yalu. Well, unfortunately, again, the poor army, you know, uh, Walton Walker is doing what he's supposed to do. But our Marine Division, we kept our supply lines open. We never got out of, of uh, uh, distance of our artillery and supporting troops and, you know, resupply and all that business. Well, Walton Walker's army was stretched to hell and gone. I mean, you know, there were 20, 30, 50 miles between elements, and some of them were battalions, some were companies. Hey, that's very easy to be surrounded and cut off. Now, we were a company, but we were prepared. MacArthur wanted to get to the Alu, and that was it. And unfortunately, he would not listen to adverse intelligence. Everything is going perfectly. Willoughby, if that rings the bell, was a major general, and he was his intelligence chief, and he would only give MacArthur what he wanted to hear. As I said, back in October from the Omaha World Herald, I got the fact that there are Chinese communists massing on the border. I said, no, they're not. You know, if there are a few, there's a few volunteers, that's all. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, there were a whole lot more than a few volunteers. So the main thing was that MacArthur just wanted to get to the Yalu, and he really wanted to go into Manchuria also, but they wouldn't let him, which was smart. So, okay, I, I think I got the picture there. So you guys were outnumbered quite a bit. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We had, uh, well, there, I'm not sure we had maybe 20,000 uh, Marines, you know, but we're spread out. 8,000 here, 8,000 here, 8,000, and so on. Uh, the Chinese had 12 divisions, as I recall, so that's like 200,000 men themselves. Yeah. Now, they were not all by us. And as a matter of fact, Fox Company uh, annihilated one, oh, I forget what it was now, a regiment, something like that, that was never, never recovered. And the division, out of 12 divisions against us, I think there were only three that were functional after the Chosen Reservoir campaign. Why is that? Why didn't they overrun you guys? Because we wouldn't let them. We shot them. We fought them. How do you feel about the Chinese today? Does that bother you? Not at all. I was in China before I went to Korea. Yeah. So, no, it doesn't bother me at all. I mean, you know, first off, most of the, them were peasants. You know, and they were fighting like we were. You're in the army, 
You go and fight, you do what they tell you to do. Probably a lot of them didn't, they weren't communists necessarily. They just were drafted into the army. You had to go, otherwise Mao Zedong would kill you. Did the bugle calls bother you guys psychologically? No, never. No, never. As a matter of fact, when we were on the mountain, why we heard them all of the time, they even played music, and they had a guy, uh, a Chinese, I'm sure, say, oh, this is Lieutenant somebody from whatever outfit he would make something up, you know, and uh, I've been with the Chinese communists now for uh, three or four weeks, and they're feeding me well and taking care of me. We suggest that you surrender. Uh, sure, you bet. <laughs> hey, Bob, tell me, in light of being a veteran in the Marine Corps, what does freedom mean to you? Well, freedom is not free. Freedom means you can have a choice. And you can do it by voting, you can get any job you want. There's no reason in the world why anyone should be, in America, should be starving. If you want to put your mind to it, you can do it. Uh, Freedom is the freedom from worry, security, happiness, family, but it isn't free. And what bothers me is listening to the radio this morning, they're talking about Bush as a, they're going to sue him and all sorts of junk. If the people who are talking like this know so much, why aren't they president? And anyone who wants to be president has got to have something wrong with them because, boy, that's nothing but trouble. One headache after another. So, you know, whether he's doing right or wrong, he's still the president. It's our country, and we need to support the effort. And it's the troops overseas. You know, they're there because they're supposed to be. Tell me about the price for freedom. Well, uh, Arlington Cemetery, the Punchbowl Cemetery in, in Hawaii, and uh, the one down at Fort Bliss, if we did not have these people to sacrifice, first off, we'd probably be speaking German or Japanese now. And uh, yeah, the, the price is tough, but when you consider what it could be, like the Iraqis now, okay, they don't have freedom at all, and they're killing each other. Well, the Civil War was kind of the same way, and there's still some people probably in South. I don't, I never hear any Northerners, Union people, saying, oh, wipe them out, or, you know, the, the, the South will rise again, or anything like that, but there are probably some Southerners like that, but I've never had any real trouble with them. Yeah, the, the price of freedom is tough, tough. And it's all those crosses and Jewish stars. What does the American flag mean to you? Well, I never thought too much about it for a long time. And uh, I was in Jordan, and uh, uh, what's his name? Um, Hussein or? No, 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 no. Yeah, Hussein was there uh, in Jordan and, um, well, it was, it, was a, it was a musical group. Fred Waring, Fred Waring came over with all his people. And they were doing patriotic songs and stuff and they had a thing with the American flag on it. And I thought, man, I miss it. I miss it. I miss seeing the flag here. That, the flag means freedom. And having fought for that freedom, that means a lot to you, I'm sure. A whole lot. Well, you know, when you're in a battle, it's probably like Iwo Jima and uh, Bella Wood and, you know, every war. When you're in it, you don't think you're making history or anything like that. It just is there. And it wasn't really until probably, oh, I'd say 20, 25 years ago, that uh, I realized that we really did something at the Chosen Reservoir. And it wasn't just my company. My company was typical, I'll say. But those people that came back from the 1st Battalion, 
The Chinese figured that we were lazy, we would go down the roads and then they'd ambush us. Well, uh, General Davis, Lieutenant Colonel Davis, no, we're going to go over the ridge lines. Now that was tough. Because these guys were hungry, they were tired, they were cold, they were wounded, they had to take everything with them, and they're going up and down hills, mountains. And that's what saved us and brought us out. Those guys should be rewarded too. And our company, of course, kept them open, so that made it easier for us to get back to the next echelon. Are you a member of the Chosen Few? Yes. Do they meet once a year? Uh, they have local chapters. We do not have any here. They have local chapters. Yes, they have a reunion every year. I've never been to one. I go to my Fox Company reunion. Well, I think you covered it pretty good with the stories that I already have. I'm real pleased with what you said. Um, I'd like to ask you to do one more thing that I ask all the... Well, actually, one, one more question. Just tell me a little bit about the Marine Corps. Uh, quick synopsis of the training, of the camaraderie, and the pride of the Marine Corps. Once a Marine, always a Marine. Well, the reason that I joined the Marine Corps, I was too young for World War II, and I had never really heard about Marines, didn't really know what they were. I saved comic books, and I got a comic book that had one about Thomas Holcomb, who was then Commandant of the Marine Corps. And I thought, oh, well, Marines, you know, he's a shooter. Good, so on. I was a shooter. Then World War II broke out, and uh, Wake Island, and there was a headline in the newspaper, and everyone had, uh, was publicizing it, that said, uh, Right before Christmas, Marines on Wake Island, what do you want? And they said, send us more Japs. And I said, well, that's my kind of outfit. So from then on, that's where I got the Marines. Uh, there, are, there are branches of all the services. The Navy SEALs are terrific people. Uh, Army Rangers and uh, Special uh, Forces and stuff like that. But all of the Marine Corps, you're a Marine. You're not a special force, you're not a SEAL, you're, not a, you're a Marine. The only one that's different is a recon Marine, and those guys are crazy. They jump out of airplanes, no parachutes and stuff like that. But we have training, we have discipline, we have tradition, that we support each other and all of that business. And then there's one more that I have come up with that you don't hear too much is reputation. And reputation is a whole bunch. Oh, you were a Marine? One story, when I got out of the Corps, I went to college and became a teacher. I was teaching speech and theater and English. And I guess I was kind of tough. And one day, a kid wrote a letter to the, uh, to the principal saying that Gaines is too tough on us. He treats us like Marines, and we're not Marines, we're students. Well, I got along well with the, with the principal, so I walked in and I said, what, shall I do anything here? I said, well, two classes that I had never had any final exams because they were all performance. So this one time I said, we're going to have uh, a final exam this time. Well, everyone gnashed their teeth and moaned and groaned and everything, so they all showed up. So I said, okay, you got two questions. One, do I treat you too much like Marines? Question two. If I do, is it good or bad? Well, everyone supported me. One kid said, no, he doesn't treat us like Marines. Marines have it easier. So that was an accolade that I treasure. Can I ask you to do one more thing? Sure. Uh, I ask all the veterans to do this. They've all said yes. and. I realize there's some parameters around the, the right and wrong way to do it, but I'd like you to give me a salute into the camera from where you're at. Okay, right into the camera, Bob. Great. Okay. Now I want you to stay there. 